Today we're going to be building and reviewing the AZA CSAZ-103. That name really rolls right off the tongue. Taking a look around this case, you can see it should have came out of the box with a case of Mountain Dew and a family sized bag of Doritos. I bought it on Newegg for around 60 bucks, but it also came with a $20 mail-in rebate, bringing my total up to around 40, which wasn't too bad for a case of this quality. Taking a look inside the case, you can see at the top, it can hold a full-size graphics card using the included PCI Express riser cable. Below that, the mini ITX motherboard is mounted and the only exhaust fan, I'm sure that won't come back to bite us later. A full-size ATX power supply is used and the only case of this form factor that I could find that held a full-size power supply. It also has a couple drive bays up top as well as a slim DVD drive slot for like a laptop sized drive. The parts we're going to be using for this build are basically all leftovers that I had kicking around. We have an ASRock Mini ITX motherboard with an i5 4690K, an AMD RX 588 GB. This was purchased recently on eBay for super cheap thanks to the great cryptocurrency crash, a Samsung 850 Pro 256 SSD, a laptop DVD drive, Two sticks of mismatched DDR3 RAM, speeds are unknown to me at this time. And a Coolmax 700 watt power supply. To start building in this case, there's two brackets you need to remove, one that goes across the length of it and another one holding the fan on. Once these brackets are out of the way, you have full access to the case and it's actually really easy to build inside of here. Here you can see the header cables all bundled up. This comes with a USB 3, USB 2, power, a Molex connector for the LEDs on the front. No reset switch though. One thing I noticed is these cables are way too long for this case. Like They could reach all the way to the other side and be poking out the back. There's no reason for them to be as long as they are. First, I put the motherboard in. This went in with no problems. It landed right on the standoffs. Didn't have any issues with it. Next, I went to mount the ATX power supply. This goes in the front and uses an extension cable that brings the plug to the back of the case. You have to remove this front panel to access that plug, as well as the mounting screws. Here you can see the plug I'm talking about. It just goes right into the power supply and then loops through this hole. But I ran into an issue here where the plug itself is hitting on a piece of metal and putting some strain on the cable. It seems like it might cause an issue down the road, so I figured I needed to do something about it. At first I thought maybe the power supply I was using has that plug in the wrong spot, so I grabbed another one just to check and it's in the exact same spot here. So it must be something up with the case. So the only way to fix this was to bust out the Dremel. So after a couple seconds with the Dremel and using a file so I don't cut myself or the cable, I was able to get the strain off of it and it now fits flush inside of there. I'm not sure if this was some oversight or something I missed, but I like it better this way so I don't feel bad cutting it. Make sure to get your Sharpie out to get that OEM look. Being a cheaper power supply, we don't have the luxury of modular or sleeved cables, so we'll have to make do with the ketchup and mustard we have here. Next, it's time to install the graphics card. This one uses a single 8-pin power connector. After installing it in place, I realized there is zero room at the top to get the power connector on once it's already inside the case. So make sure to plug that in before you mount it or you're going to be doing the work twice. This case came with a bracket to support the graphics card at the rear. 
This attaches with just a single screw. Here's the included PCI Express riser cable. Mine was very flexible, but some reviews online mentioned theirs being too stiff and didn't make a good connection. I didn't have any of these problems and mine connected just fine. Now it's time to install the two sticks of RAM. Wait for that satisfying click. Oh yeah, I muted that, huh? Here we are installing some of the last connectors, the power button header, as well as some of the other. You know how to build a computer, so I'm not gonna break this down. Here's what the cables looked like before I did anything. I mean, it's not too bad, right? There we go, that's better. Spent a few minutes, tucked some cables away, and now it looks halfway decent. Putting it back together, make sure to reattach these brackets. Always make sure to have some zip ties handy. They're essential for PC building, as well as car building. Taking a look at the finished product, you can see here that everything fits nicely inside of this case. With all the brackets removed, it's super easy to build in and probably the easiest small form factor build I've ever done. Since I didn't use any three and a half inch drive bays, I was able to tuck most of the excess cables up into this area, giving us a cleaner look than what would have been otherwise. Time to power it on. Let's see if it works on the first try. And it looks like it does. And I'll just pretend that was the first try. Now we have it in what I hope to be its final location and let's power it on and see if we get to BIOS on the first try. I swear this was the first try. No movie magic here. Our processor and RAMs recognized normally. That sweet, sweet 12 gigs. This is where I had my old small form factor PC and you can see this case fits right at home there. It sticks out a little bit, but it doesn't bother me. It actually gives you access to the USB ports that are facing up while it's in this orientation. Now I can already hear you typing in the comments. What about the thermals? What about temperature? There's no airflow in there. Well, let me tell you something. You're absolutely right. I ran this for like five minutes on Time Spy. We hit 89 degrees. It underclocked by 400 megahertz and basically sounded like a jet engine taking off. Who would have thought this computer would run hotter than my old one packing a monster 750 Ti and third gen i5. So I decided to try it again with the case sitting outside of the entertainment center using the included stand that up until this point I failed to mention. After running the benchmark for around 20 minutes, I got 82 degrees and no underclocking. So we had an eight degree reduction in temps by just not being stuffed inside of the entertainment center. Overall, I'm very happy with this case. It was the easiest small form factor build I've ever done Aside from having to make that cut, which was more of a preference thing, as that cable would have probably been fine as is. The most impressive thing about this case is that it can fit a full-size GPU and power supply while having roughly the same footprint as a console. In my research, this was the only case that I could find that fit a full ATX PSU in this form factor. Obviously thermals can be an issue depending on where you place the case and you can see here that the graphics card exhausts air directly out of one of those vents and the way I had it placed put those vents against a hard surface with no air gap. We have another great case from the legendary manufacturer Aza, but in all seriousness for the size features and price you can't beat it and I have no problems giving it a full recommendation.
If you enjoyed this video, please consider sticking around as I have some fun projects in the works. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.